Luke Pinkerton is uh, secretary for 380 and he'll take it from here. All right, thanks, Jim. So I just wanted to introduce the topic a little bit. Uh, Jim and I uh, have been working on this, uh, this committee work for about five years now. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're just going to go to the next slide. And, and really, a lot of this comes from, you know, the, the, the idea of plain concrete doesn't sound that, that cool. But the reality is, is that our industry really needs to start to look at how we start to develop, use our advanced materials, use our advanced analysis methods to be more efficient with concrete. And some of the reasons are here. You can see uh, the PCA roadmap is, is three, of, three of their uh, priorities for us as we go into the next, uh, as we try to achieve carbon neutrality is to look at how do we optimize concrete? How do we over, avoid over design and leverage construction technologies? And then how do we educate the industry on those innovations? And you know what drives that obviously is uh, a, a number of factors. It's not just the, the need to reach carbon neutrality um, as Bill Gates uh, kind of outlined in his book, as well as the PCA roadmap has outlined uh, in the entire industry is moving towards, but it's also these other forces that are impacting our industry. Shortages in materials, long supply chains, um, difficulty getting labor into our industry. Um, we really need to kind of take a, a, a step forward to start to address these things. And it is a little bit you know, interesting that, uh, that this was actually done already uh, in, in 118 AD. The Panthenon. The Panthenon is a structure that used advanced analysis techniques, basically developing concrete into an arch that forced it all into compression, but it didn't stop there. You know, you know this was 2000 plus years ago. They also were using advanced materials technology. A lot of people don't know that as they went up to the top of that arch, it's a pure arch, they actually developed lightweight concrete because at the top, they actually use pumice as the aggregate because it got, you know, the, the, the weight becomes overwhelming. So they started with heavier, stronger aggregates at the bottom and then sort of graded it up to the very top. This structure has been up since 118 AD. Nobody else even attempted this until something like 1800 AD or yeah, 1800 AD. Uh, and I can't remember the structure that was built, but. This technology was there and then we kind of walked away from it. So if we go to like today, we have situations where we're trying to build cold storage facilities and things like that, where they're still uh, trying to use heavy amounts of reinforcement in slabs on ground, very expensive to install, very difficult to install. Uh, even though it's not necessarily needed if you look at, if you analyze it in a proper way. Um, and then I, I, I kind of ask, what, what about the future? You know, say we start to leave this planet and do other things. You know, we're not going to ship rebar to other planets. How can we use advanced materials, nanotechnology, um, things like fibers, things like other forms of alternate reinforcement to, that, that can be, become integral to the mix to, to do what we need to do? Uh, I think steel will always have a, a place in it, but it's, it's a question of how can we be more efficient? And I'm really excited uh, today because our speakers are going to kind of tell us a little bit about how that's been done. Uh, one, one example of an industry that's already embraced this is the tilt-up concrete industry. Now, they don't design these tilt panels for actual service using plain concrete methods, but this erection design is based on plain concrete design. They do a flexural test to assure the concrete can basically be erected like that in an uncracked state. So they actually uh, will set the number of lifting points. Um, the thickness and all that is, is, is checked by the, the uh, engineers that do the erection design to assure that panel stays uncracked going up. They've been doing this since really the beginning of the tilt um, industry, which I don't know how many years is, it's been, Jim, since the first year. World War II, um, and they're using uh, basically the full modulus of rupture, whereas ACI 318 only allows us to use about a quarter 
of the modulus of rupture when we design with plain concrete in chapter 14. So the question then becomes, why are we discounting that the ability that industry has shown and proven with, for example, tilt going all the way back to the Romans? Why don't we allow industry to develop concrete mixes that have optimal flexural strength and then have the engineers be able to use that? It can then, of course, be ver verified by field testing. Fritz Kramrich, um, very interesting guy. I could tell you I've done a lot of research. He was the chair of ACI 322. This was an actual standalone code that existed in the 1970s uh, on structural plain concrete. That code had a provision in it where you could either take a multiple of the, the compressive strength or you could actually do flexural testing and use that for design. So. Where this whole thing started is we asked the question, we asked ACI, why is that not still in the code? Why are we fixed with a, more of a prescriptive value based on uh, compressive strength? And they agreed, that's a question that needs to be answered. And uh, we reinstated ACI 322. Uh, it was given a new number, ACI 380. And for anybody who's interested in following along, we, we meet on Sundays. Uh, we had a mini session today and we're working towards developing uh, uh, what we want to be is the go to uh, committee for plain structural concrete applications and advise other committees who are interested in this as to how it can be used, how it can be leveraged. How can we do what the Romans did 2000 years ago um, as we look to the future? So these are some of the things that we're we're working on today. We're going to have speakers that focus on some really cool applications. And I, I, would, I would also remind you that plain structural concrete doesn't necessarily mean plain. The ACI defines it as anything that has less than the code required amount of reinforcement. So open your mind a little bit to that as you watch these presentations. Uh, in order to safely use it, we have to address all these issues, ductility. We're gonna be talking about ductility. We're gonna talk about some really cool applications uh, where we, married some materials that allowed us to do some things with without reinforcement. But then we're also gonna talk about ductility, we're gonna talk about failure and fracture mechanics. Um, and we're gonna talk about uh, applications and we're also gonna talk about industry needs um, in things like slabs and, and walls where we're just sort of indiscriminately putting reinforcement in these things you know, that may not be necessary. Again, all this takes a lot of analysis uh, before we can uh, implement it, but um, this is this is the work of the committee. So uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Joseph Safran. Uh, he's a he's going to be our first speaker. Um, he's the co-founder and CEO of FormFound Design. Uh, FormFound is a Los Angeles-based design studio that operates at the intersection of technology and nature. Joseph is a licensed architect in California, a professor of architecture at Orange Coast College. He bridges the gap between technology and material ex exploration, exploring advancements in robotics, material science, and form founding. Along with his partner, Ron Culver, they pioneered a new concrete casting method uh, to realize the world's first robotic cast concrete pavilion harnessing fabric formwork technology. Uh, this proof of concept was built for Amazon and is featured and features 70 uniquely cast concrete wishbones that were assembled within one sixteenth of an inch tolerance. FormFound Design is currently designing humanitarian housing solutions using on-demand mobile factories for light gauge steel framework construction. FormFound Design is also pursuing international work at various scales. So yeah, I, I don't know if I like that term structural plain concrete. I think we could rebrand that, make it structural uh, minimal concrete, something that sounds a little more interesting. Um, I'm gonna tell you about some of the work that actually began in grad school. Uh, I met my business partner, Ron, when uh, we were at UCLA. We noticed there was a disconnect in the industry where architects love designing with variation and complexity. But when it goes to be built, the contractor has to charge a premium for anything that has any kind of variation. They have to build additional molds. So there's a premium that's associated with that. So 
We love this quote by Nervi, um, famous architect who was passionate about concrete and exploring its various uh, structural capabilities, but also its sculptural capabilities. Um, we started with this intention of animating the casting process where rather than um, just having to build a unique mold for every new shape of concrete, what if we could uh, somehow take the same piece of uh, fabric formwork and manipulate it with robotics, basically creating an adjustable mold for concrete. And so we started with this idea that we could use the precision of robots and the dimensional freedom of fabric to create this adjustable mold. So this started again at UCLA. We said, what if we could take the same sleeve of fabric and manipulate it with industrial robot arms, the same robot arms that manufacture cars and are used in the automotive industry all the time. So we began with research that was small scale. We created an end arm tool to attach to the robots. We created this clamping system so that we could attach fabric to it. This was all small scale. We embedded a nut in the concrete and basically drove a bolt through this three-sided, what we called a coupler. And um, we simulated a lot of the, the way the fabric would react digitally. This is in a software called uh, Kangaroo. It's a plugin for a software we call Rhino in our industry. And it was also about animating the robot. So each robot had its own position for each unique piece of concrete that we had to cast. So it was about sending the digital file that had a lot of complexity and different components, sending that to the robots, the robots positioned fabric, and then we were able to pour. So a lot of this was animating what would actually happen and looking at kind of the, the physics of it. And then getting into the lab, you know, we, we kind of used whatever materials we, we had available at the time, um, including an orange juice container to, to act as a funnel. Um, but we, we started doing this and this actually went viral for a while. This was in 2014, kind of under the, the context of robots are stealing American jobs, which we thought was funny because humans weren't really doing this before we uh, started <laughs> experimenting. Um, but it was kind of an interesting, at that time, concrete 3D printing was still uh, very exciting and, and very new. It still is, but I think it's become a little more mainstream now. But what we did was created this proof of concept that was maybe three feet tall. It got published. We gave talks on this. And uh, our professor, Greg Lynn, at the time asked, well, what is it? What are you going to use this for? And we said, well, this is a proof that we can not only create a new CAD CAM process, right? computer aided design to computer aided manufacturing. We can send something that's complex with a lot of variation with high precision. We can send it from uh, the computer to the built world and actually get it fabricated. Um, as Nigel mentioned in his talk yesterday, um, you know, there's a very big disconnect between uh, what's when, when an architect designs freeform geometry and how it's actually, you know, the formwork is created, how the um, rebar is installed, that there's a disconnect there. So if we could somehow bridge that gap, that's what we were interested in. So around that time, Amazon reached out to us and they commissioned a 15 foot tall structure. We had never built anything more than three feet. So we told them we have to scale up. We have to reach out to a structural engineer. Uh, we worked with Walter P. Moore Engineering. Um, and this was one of the first designs that we sent them. They, they kept kind of telling us, we want this to be bigger. We want this to be bigger. Um, it's for a invite only conference that Jeff Bezos hosts every year called the Mars Conference which stands for machine learning, automation, robotics, and space exploration. So he brings in uh, industry leaders in robotics and space. I'm not sure why he invited us, but for some reason we ended up there. And I told my business partner, there's no uh, bigger stage to either succeed or to fail on. So we better succeed. Um, so we scaled our operation up. This was kind of the digital workflow that we came up with where we can go from a digital file in Rhino um, using this plugin called Grasshopper. And then there's another plugin called Kangaroo. You'll hear a lot of animal names for our software that we use. 
Our structural engineer used Strand. They did a finite element analysis. They, um, they looked at the data. They would come back to us. There was kind of a feedback loop where they said, you know, yes, you've optimized the design, but we can also, you know, have these inputs. So we would go back. So there's a feedback loop here. And then we would send the model back. And then the way we would talk to the robots was through a plugin called uh, Taco, which was written by another architect who found the need to convert to robot code. So the geometry we looked at in the same way Gaudi used hanging chain models to simulate uh, his arches and his vaults that he would design. We did the same thing, but with a digital hanging chain model. So this is using that plugin Kangaroo. We're able to simulate the way gravity would act on this in an inverse way so that each member in concrete could be used uh, the way its primary loading scenario prefers in compression. So the idea here was that each member could be primarily in compression. We can use concrete the way it's designed. Our structural engineer sent us this and we said, well, is this can actually move this much? They said, no, this is an exaggeration um, of, of what the forces will do. So in their finite element analysis, they were able to look at each connection and treat each wishbone uh, as its own uh, element. This was a brick displacement diagram. And I thought what was interesting about this was they were able to identify these two locations here as you know, potential areas for concern. And when we built the structure, they said this was this still passed all their uh, tests, but they said, and when we built it, we actually did see two little micro cracks in this area. So they were fine, but it was just one of those interesting ways that the digital informed uh, the built reality. So they, our engineer at Walter P. Moore, um, they, they looked, uh, they looked through this and, and confirmed that it, it meets the, uh, meets the requirements for both uh, compression um, and flexural. So their, their uh, finite element analysis actually looks at tensile strength. So that was one of the tests they had to make sure that it passed. Our first idea was, uh, you know, probably not the best. We thought about using uh, a, a solid block of aluminum boring holes into it and using that as a connector for the concrete. Um, it's probably a good thing that we went away from that, but at first we, uh, we realized uh, we had probably cast maybe 15 pieces of concrete at this point, getting ready for this Amazon conference. Um, we, on the same day that we found out, you know what, we were using an older version of the model. So all those parts that we had just spent days casting are now outdated. That same day that we found that out, we also realized we got back all of the aluminum parts, all these aluminum couplers, and they were all out of tolerance. They were an eighth inch off. They had the fabricator decided to, to sand them down and, and polish them, which took them out of tolerance. So this was one of those moments where our, our partnership really, uh, I think, thrived. And this is when it really uh, came into play. My partner said, look, you discovered two problems on the same day. We can actually solve both of them with the same solution. One, we can go to a steel coupler that'll be stronger and we could use steel plate that's welded, makes a lot more sense with concrete. We can also redesign the coupler to work with the shapes that we've already cast because they're a different size. So we solved two problems in the same day. And that was another one of those moments where I had to step back and kind of take a breather, but it was, it was my partner who stepped in and said, no, you know, this is actually an opportunity. So the coupler we designed was steel plates, um, all welded together. We cast the, the nut into the concrete wishbone and we allowed these openings so that we could drive a bolt. We could fit our uh, Allen key into this and, and attach the bolt to each concrete piece. So this is a three-sided connection uh, for concrete. This is the water jet cutting the steel. There's all these uh, metal fabricators in Los Angeles. Originally the aerospace industry blossomed in LA. So all these fabricators set up. Today, a lot of them work for Hollywood. They work for the movie industry. So their tolerances, at first we had to kind of go back and forth with them and say, no, we need, we need higher precision for this project. We're using robots that have 
precision that's a fraction of a millimeter, we need something that's very precise. They said, oh, you want us to build a jig and do it that way? I said, yes, okay. So they finally understood what we were looking for and they uh, were able to design with the tolerance we needed. So this is our robots being shipped. So we worked with ABB Robotics to, uh, to borrow two large robots on loan together with these steel pallets, each one weighed 8,000 pounds. So getting this into our warehouse in downtown Los Angeles was quite a feat. And we also ran both robots off of the same CPU. So instead of two six axis robots with their own brains, we essentially had one 12 axis robot running off of the same brain. So each knew where the other one was um, to within microns. So this highly precise set of robots uh, were working with this digital software. So this is within Rhino sending the 3D um, positioning to the robots uh, via robot code. So the robots will manipulate, they'll move to the, the next position so that we can cast each uh, wishbone. We had a whole, a whole assembly line process set up. Uh, we had interns, we had, I think about 20 volunteers from friends of mine that came in and helped on this project. The cement that we looked at, we looked at a number of, of different products. What we arrived at was a product that we could get at any local Home Depot and that had a very fast initial set time, uh, about 15 minutes for cemental. And that's really what appealed to us because at this point, we only had about two weeks left to cast 70 pieces of concrete and time was of the essence. So we started using this product and, and we actually also looked at a way, we didn't wanna bend rebar into 70 unique shapes. So we, our engineer told us about Helix Twisted Steel Micro Rebar. This was kind of a breakthrough for us. Not only again, did it save us time instead of bending rebar, we could just mix steel fiber in. It allowed us to create stronger concrete and our engineers had, I think, used this in the past. So this was kind of a breakthrough for us. And it was also a breakthrough uh, for Ken and Luke who had never talked to each other. We introduced them and I think they've uh, blossomed in their uh, relationship as well, being able to put these two products together. Um, so we were able to get compressive strength with the helix of around 12,000 PSI. So the, the, some, the blue bag of CTS rapid set already is around 9,000 PSI. So we were able to uh, significantly increase that to a value that our engineers were happy with. So this is the process of showing the, the robots moving to the first position. We would stretch the fabric because you don't want it to sag. It has to maintain the original geometry that we designed. Um, we ended up em employing this uh, aircraft cable in the center of the section of wishbone. Our engineers first questioned this. They said, "Why this? you know this isn't gonna replace rebar. And we said, yes, but in the event that there's any kind of cracking, there's, as a last resort, that cable will be the thing that's going to hold that one wishbone in place. And they said, okay, we can, we can buy off on that logic. Um, so mixing the steel into the mix, every, each, each piece had uh, its own, we had to make sure that we understood the volume of the geometry. So each one had its own unique ratio that we had to mix. So it was a very manually labor intensive process, as you can see here, as much as we use robotics to automate, uh, you can tell how much manual labor went into this. You know, I think if we were to advance this, we could probably develop a, a pumping system and things like that. But you can see us manually vibrating the, the mix and, and moisture wicking out of the fabric. This is a nylon fabric. We began using a Lycra, which was a lot more flexible. It's like spandex, so it would droop a lot more. So we uh, upgraded this as we had to scale up. I should mention that there's other pioneers uh, in, in architecture and, and concrete who've looked at fabric. Mark West is one of them. Um, Andrew Cudless has done a, a number of uh, concrete and fabric experiments as well. So we, we had to custom design all the end arm tools for the robots. And then this is us moving the robots away so that we can remove each wishbone of concrete. And we were measuring these as they came off the robot, making sure that they're within tolerance. And these were, you know, within a 16th of an inch as we were measuring them, but we didn't have the opportunity to actually 
bolt any two together until we actually got to Palm Springs. So a little more on that later, but these are each of the geometries. You're seeing the robots uh, moving into each position. This was a unique piece because as you can tell, this is our, our fill point. We were pouring from here. So somehow we had to fill this limb and then somehow force concrete to flow uphill. So this was one of those dilemmas where we realized, well, wait, we have robots. Let's use them uh, in, to their capabilities here. So we said, let's fill when it's down here and then cap it and then rotate it so that we can achieve that geometry. And yeah, we could have changed the geometry, but that would have changed the design and we were almost done at this point. So we don't want to do that. So this is a, a time lapse showing the kind of the system that we were working with. You can see the clock in the background. Um, you're seeing the, the concrete curing through the fabric here. The entire, you know, for one wishbone, it, we were able to take it off the robots in about an hour. So it was a very efficient process. Um, you couldn't tell from kind of the messiness of our warehouse, but uh, that was a quite an exciting experience. This is the only drawing that we had for the project. This is an assembly diagram that labels each part and labels uh, each side of the limb. So anyone could look at this and we did. When we were in Palm Springs, we were teaching people that had never seen our project. They had built pavilions and installations for uh, conference or for uh, music festivals like Coachella. So they had built things like that. They had never seen anything like this, but we showed them this assembly diagram and they were able to figure out where each part would go. We got to Palm Springs, each part was labeled. Jeff Bezos was walking around. Uh, so there is kind of a lot of pressure here. Our intern goes to install the first two pieces and they need to fit together like this perfectly. He goes to install them and they're missing each other by feet, different angles. And that was another one of those moments where I had to step back, take a breather. And he said, oh, you know what? It's just mislabeled. And he rotates it. And sure enough, it fits perfectly back to <laughs> And we went through 70 pieces. That was the only one that was mislabeled out of all 70. Of course, it's the first one that we go to try to install. And similar to yesterday's talk, our engineer told us, oh, by the way, we've only engineered this in its final state. It, getting it built is, is up to you. So we, we said, well, maybe in, instead of starting with each wall, we start with the corners. So each corner will support itself. And as a last resort, we'll use these kind of crutches that my, my partner engineered, uh, kind of like cane crutches to support them. Um, so as we bolted these together, the entire structure in, in itself kind of wanted to lean. So this is all just built on a stage platform. This is uh, a wood ba plywood base. The whole structure wanted to kind of cave in on itself as we were building, just creep a little bit, making that last piece at the very top extremely difficult to install. We did the in, in total install in about two days, and then it took us a third day, and it took us the full day to install that last piece on top, the capstone, because the whole, pe the whole structure had started creeping out of tolerance just enough. So in the same way you would adjust a bike wheel, we unbolted all the pieces loosened everything up and then installed that top piece and then tightened everything back up again. So there were a lot of uh, kind of hurdles to get through. In the end, we only had one person at the conference try to climb it and he got all the way to the top before the conference uh, people got him to come down. Um, but it showed that it was, it was strong enough to withstand that. We actually engineered it. Our engineers said, um, when they, they first got back to us, they said, you know, this isn't going to withstand uh, the loads that we're applying to it. And I said, well, what loads are you applying? And they said, we're, we're, the scenario is seven people hanging on to it during an earthquake. And I said, I'm pretty sure we can avoid at least one of those scenarios. And they said, okay, otherwise it's, it's fine. It'll, it'll stand. Uh, what we were interested in also is the kind of textural nature of this. This is this is the surface of the concrete that you're seeing. And, and there's kind of pleats and remnants of the fabric uh, and the stitches that were left over. We also were able to get this uh, to come to Los Angeles. This is at a, a local architecture and design museum. They said, we don't have room in our, our building, but you can build it in our uh, parking lot. So that's what we did. So we had an opening reception. I think you can see Luke there. 
Um, what was great as, as architects is we love seeing how architecture influences behavior. And so we were able to kind of see the geo tags that people were tagging on social media. And it was interesting. They all always kind of stand in the same place and take these selfies. And it was just kind of an interesting impact to see the community responding to something like this. So it, you know, there wasn't really much explanation uh, as to what it was, but people were just attracted to it. I think most people probably didn't even know it was concrete even at our conference, probably didn't fully understand that at the Mars conference. Um, later, after I had started teaching at Orange Coast College, a local shopping mall commissioned us to, to build this. So I thought this is a great opportunity to have the students start experimenting with the concrete and have them start doing research at a community college level. So we said, let's do the same thing, but scale it down. Um, we worked with Helix and, and CTS again to pour the slab. Uh, they. Uh, Helix donated uh, their, U their uh, UHPC product. So when we mix that with steel, we were able to get uh, 20,000 PSI in compression for each of these wishbones. We did see this as an opportunity to update the detail. We didn't want to have, have to have concrete touching concrete. So we, we embedded these steel boots at the end of each wishbone so that we could have a steel to steel connection that would be less brittle, less prone to chipping. So these were kind of the specs that we used. We had access to a plasma cutter. So we cut each of these kind of lemon shapes. Um, this is another benefit of, of actually not just working with uh, fabricators, but asking them their opinion and saying, how would you design this? Our original design looked nothing like this, but after talking to them and realizing, yeah, let's just weld pipe to this, have rebar sticking out, we could actually get the concrete to fill this and you know the wishbone would be out here. But we could actually create a stronger embedment this way. So our fabricator was heavily influ you know, influencing us in this and, and that dialogue became extremely valuable to us. So as every step of the process, we were talking to fabricators, talking to them and not just telling them what to do, but hearing their input on the project. So this is the plasma cutter in action. Um, we got some interesting shots from that. Uh, what was, this was essentially that coupler idea where we would, this, this pipe allowed us to clamp using a pipe clamp. We could pipe clamp fabric to that and then fill this with concrete. So we called this cytocast. If you're ever in uh, Costa Mesa, California, this is still up uh, at a local shopping mall called the Lab Anti-Mall. Uh, they're against any uh, traditional corporate labs, uh, corporate shopping malls. So they're very uh, off the beaten path and they have smaller pop-up uh, shopping experiences. Um, so we worked with the client, the lab. I worked with the students to, this is us talking about timeline, um, getting them to experiment with, you know, first without the robots, how do you, you know, pour concrete manually, that process, getting them to experiment and then introducing the robots. Um, this is us showing the client, she was working for the lab how to use a robot and how to manually jog it with a teach pendant. We also have a maker space. So we had access to virtually any tool, CNC mills, laser cutters, 3D printers. Um, so that, that was instrumental in this, but we worked with the fashion department at OCC. We worked with welding. We worked with uh, machine technology. They were the ones that CNC milled. This is, um, this is them in action, kind of working with uh, creating custom end arm tools. These are the things that attach to the robot, allowing us to attach our, end, our coupler to the robot. So CNC milling the steel, again, working with the fashion department. This is one of my architecture students laying out fabric. Uh, this is nylon donated by the fashion department and just working with these different departments. And, and in colleges, there's often these silos that don't talk to each other. So this was an opportunity for us to kind of break those silos and get different people working together, which was for me, part of the, the fun of this. Um, so we had to widen some of the holes of the coupler. So using an old uh, Bridgeport drill press for that. And uh, again, working with the students, I think the, the interesting thing for them was they're seeing this live. They're seeing the collaboration process, the kind of, we call it design research, where it's not generating the traditional data that we, you know, a normal university would be generating, but we're experimenting, we're getting our hands dirty and uh, testing new materials, testing technologies. And again, using this CAD CAM process. So we're sending files 
from the digital to the robots in a different way. And then those robots are translating that into a built form. So you're seeing some of the, the messy process that went into this, but in the end, um, we, we think the, the students really benefited from the, the research, but also I think it was, a, it was a good thing to have in their portfolios. They have to think about their, their next steps too is in, in the profession and when they transfer to a five-year school. Architecture is a five-year program. They, they don't think four years is enough for us. So we also, Helix donated the steel for this as well. So that was mixed in. So yeah, with this material, we were getting about 20,000 PSI. So each wishbone was stronger than our, our Mars pavilion. One thing we'd like to avoid is casting concrete inside a classroom. That's one thing that uh, is really difficult to remove. As, as you know, that dust gets everywhere. So that's something that I think this process could be improved on. And then this is us installing it at the shopping mall. So we saw this as an opportunity for this to be kind of a portal where people could walk underneath it and they could take, take selfies and take photos underneath it. Um, so this is kind of a, that time-lapse assembly. And um, yeah, so CTS donated the slab. They, they donated all the concrete that we used. Uh, and again, you're seeing the assembly diagrams uh, taped to our our step stool there. So again, students are able to gather volunteers and help understand how each uh, pavilion like this gets assembled. And then opening night, we had to light it up and uh, had a, a big reception for it. And then some final photos of the design once it was done. And then this last little bit, we said the next semester I asked, well, what else could we use robots for? And we said, well, we could actually use robots to CNC mill a rigid foam, a high density foam, and then use that as a, as a mold or as a formwork for concrete. So we started with these initial tests, attaching a spindle onto a robot. And yes, we could use a traditional CNC mill for this, but we saw the potential for robotics to actually be able to uh, move in six axes and not just in, in three. So if we had to sculpt something three-dimensionally, this would be an application for it. Um, so this is used already in, in, the, in the concrete industry, but we said, well, what if we coupled that with this new digital technology we had? There was a new plugin, another animal in the kingdom. Uh, this is called Parakeet, which allows us to generate patterns similar to Escher, Escher drawings, MC Escher that would, uh, these are tessellations. So it's the same repeated geometry that can grow, not just radially, radially, but it can grow in the X, Y, and Z axis. So we said, what if we create these little pavers? So each student had their own paver design. They sent their code to the robot. We used a, another animal software to use that. That was called Octopus, which allows us to talk to the robots uh, in this case. And we also used an Autodesk product called Fusion 360. That was what generated the G-code, which is basically the tool path that the robot will follow. So it's this translation from the digital file to robot code to the built form. So this is the robot doing some milling. We quickly discovered how brittle and uh, difficult it is to work with high density foam. So this was some of the first, some of the first molds that we used. And you could just see some of the chipping that would happen in the, in the foam. So we said, well, what if we took this and we use silicone instead? So we did the same thing. We were able to create these pavers. This idea was, well, let's mill the negative and then pour silicone to be the positive formwork. And then we'll use the silicone as the mold for concrete. So you're seeing the robot. We actually 3D printed this little connector so that we could attach a vacuum to this. Um, since that, we've actually purchased a 3D printer for 
uh, carbon fiber infused nylon. So rather than these cheap PLA plastic 3D prints, we're able to print parts that are actually usable and you could actually uh, attach to a robot in a, in a method like that. So this is one of my students removing the concrete from the actual silicone mold. All right, and that was, uh, this is the last photo we have showing that process. So thank you very much.